Well, hello, and welcome to Gungahlin Anglican Church. Great to have you here with us today. My name is Andrew Taylor. I'm the Senior Minister for the Gungahlin Anglican Church. Now, let me kick our service off uh, with a psalm. Psalm 117. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Extol him, all you peoples. For great is his love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Confession. Although we are the people of God, Scripture reminds us that we still sin. We need to confess our failures, knowing that the Lord Jesus died for us and intercedes for us with the Father. Let us draw near to God, who freely forgives through his infinite goodness and mercy, and pray to him with sincerity and confidence. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you and serve you as we should. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace, that we may continue to grow as members of Christ 
in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. God is slow to anger and full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and turn to his son, Jesus Christ, in whom there is no condemnation. Amen. A reading from Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. And they said to each other, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. And then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower the people were building. The Lord said, If as one people speaking the same language they have begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them over all the earth and they stopped building the city. That is why it was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. This is the word of the Lord. Our second reading today comes from Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 23. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since... What may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without an excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. This is the word of the Lord. Wilder was born in 1867 in the big woods of Wisconsin. Of course, she's best known for her Little House series books, Little House on the Prairie being the most famous. Those books are about the pioneering life that she lived. In several of her books, she describes what it was like to make long journeys, hundreds of miles in distance, across wild and unsettled lands. And she describes what it was like to live in areas that were nearly untouched, by civilization. The historical distance between her pioneer life and our modern lives is exactly what made her writing so fascinating for generations of children. But did you know that Laura Ingalls Wilder, the pioneer girl, actually died at the age of 90 in 1957? The same year, that is, that Russia launched a satellite and a dog into space. She died only four years before humans orbited the moon and 12 years before Neil Armstrong set foot on it. The year 1957 was the year that marked the dawn of the jet age with the first flight of the Boeing 707, an aircraft that could make in just one hour the kind of journey that took Laura and her family months to make. The world that Laura Ingalls Wilder was born into had ceased to exist long before she died. Her lifetime spanned the age of horse and carriage and jet travel. She witnessed changes in every possible area of life. Going back a little further, in his account of the Lewis and Clark expedition, historian Stephen Ambrose notes that a critical fact in the world of 1801 was that nothing moved faster than the speed of a horse. 
No human being, no manufactured item, no bushel of wheat, no letter, no information, no idea, no order, no instruction of any kind moved faster. And in fact, nothing had ever moved faster. But two inventions in the middle of the 19th century changed all that and changed the world forever. The first was the steam train, which meant for the first time that people could actually travel faster than the speed of a horse. But the telegraph, the second invention, meant that ideas and messages could be transmitted and received almost instantly. Arguably, these inventions changed the world more than anything even in our own lifetime. Yes, I know the internet and possibly even more so the Wi-Fi that enables the internet would certainly give it a run for their money, but those things really set in place the communications ideals that we have today. We don't have a monopoly in our generation on world changing technology. Technology is so equated with digital technology these days that it's hard to remember that technology is any tool that helps us. One definition of technology that I like is this. Technology is the creative activity of using tools to shape God's creation for practical purposes. I'm in a very short time going to try and give a Christian overview and a biblical overview of technology. I can only really touch on the edges. I've borrowed pretty heavily from a book called The Next Story by a guy called Tim Challey. So if you want to go deeper into this stuff, I highly recommend his book. It's really good. Another one is uh, 12 Ways Your Phone Is Changing You by a guy called Tony Reinke. You can actually find that book for free on the internet, so it's worth looking up. Lastly, if you've got Netflix and you're interested in exploring some of the particularly negative side effects of digital technology, uh, which I'll just touch on a little later. I recommend watching the documentary, if you haven't already, The Social Dilemma. I watched it the other night, uh, and it certainly is eye-opening as to what some of these big companies are doing, and in a way feel compelled to do, uh, because that's the model that's been set up for them nearly 20 odd years ago now. So I'm just gonna give us a general overview on three things. Firstly, technology is a good God-given gift. Secondly, like everything else in creation, technology is subject to the curse. And thirdly, most technology in itself is morally neutral, but how we use it can either honour God or be sinful. So firstly, technology is a good God-given gift. In the first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, we read that God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. See, these words right at the beginning, when everything was good before the fall, tell us that we're made to resemble the creator God on earth. Like when we look at our kids, we can see either for good or bad ourselves in them, We're meant to see the family resemblance of God in each other. Like God, we too are spiritual beings. Like God, we are able to love. Like God, we have a kind of moral freedom. How we use that is another question. Like God, we are able to create. Just as God created, we create. Of course, we can't make things out of nothing as God did, but we can use the tools that God has given us to create. God has given human beings the ability to think, to come up with remarkable ideas, to be innovative, and technology is the practical result of that creative process. In Genesis, God gives what we might call the first job description. He says, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. That first phrase, be fruitful and multiply, means to develop the social world, to build families, to build churches, to build schools and cities and governments and laws. But that second phrase, subdue the earth, means to harness the natural world. That involves things like planting crops and building bridges and designing computers and composing music. See, God's basic instruction to mankind at the beginning is to develop the resources of the natural world and use God-given abilities to bring glory to him. God is glorified in our creativity. Whether that leads us to a painting that moves hearts to praise or to design a plough that will allow us to better harvest and or plant crops. 
To do these things, we need to rely on the practical fruit of our creative abilities, which is technology. <clears throat> Rory Shiner, a West Australian pastor, speaking on Genesis at Men's Convention a, a few years ago, if you were there, said this. He said, I bet you I can guess what you do for a job. And he was right, because what he said was, he said, what you do for a job is you bring order out of chaos. And when we do that well, we reflect our creator God who did the same in the beginning. The first chapter of Genesis describes God bringing order out of chaos and creating the world. But Genesis 3 threw a spanner into the works of this good plan. So even though technology is a good gift, a good God-given gift, like everything else in creation, this is our second point, technology is subject to the curse. Like everything else in creation, technology is subject to the curse. See, the relationship between humans and the technology we create isn't as simple as we'd like to think. We know from the Bible that soon after mankind was formed, they disobeyed God, alienating us from God, bringing us under God's curse. And the earth itself, Genesis 3 tells us, and Romans and other places, is also bearing the burden. Still, the command to create and the desire to create would remain. It would just get a whole lot tougher. The earth was no longer a friendly place for human beings. Rather, the natural world was now hostile and actively opposed to us. See, because of the fall, now we have to fight for survival. And we have to use every gift and every ability that God has given us to do that. In a world like ours, technology becomes even more important. Why? Because it enables us to regain some control over our lives, to fulfill our God-given dreams and desires. See, a sinless world had no need of medicine. But a fallen world requires the development of medical and health technologies for human survival and flourishing. A sinless world had no need of weapons, but a fallen world requires the development of weapons technologies for defense against animals and unfortunately other human beings. A sinless world provided for their basic needs, enabling humans to live in comfort and relative ease. But a fallen world requires the development of technolog technologies that will keep us warm and cool in hostile climates. Uh, the technologies of herbicides that prevent crops from being choked by weeds. In a fallen world, technology actually enables human survival. So technology is a good gift, that's our first point, affected by the fall, that's our second point. But thirdly, most technology in itself is neutral, but how we use it can either honour God or be sinful. See, we live with the harsh, undeniable reality that we are sinful people living in a world marked by God's curse. We are reminded that by that every day, and possibly more so for most of us in this year than, than any other time in our life. And in this world, technology then presents us with a spiritual challenge because it's meant to serve us in fulfilling our created purpose. Because it makes our lives easier and longer and more comfortable, we can be prone to rely on technology to give our lives meaning. We can pr be prone to trust technology to provide an ultimate answer for the frustration of life in a fallen world. So then, Technology is uniquely susceptible to be becoming an idol in our life. In other words, it's uh, prone to be elevated to the place of God in our lives. See, the phone you've got in your pocket or in front of you right now isn't an evil device. But it is prone to draw your, draw your heart away from God. It is prone to distract you and to enable you to rely on your own abilities instead of God. Most things are actually morally neutral. Even when we consider something like the technology be behind nuclear fusion that created uh, nuclear weapons, we need to recognize that the same technology that can level a city can, and can kill thousands of people can also power that city and, and provide hospitals and provide quality of life for its inhabitants. The same technology that allows doctors to operate on an unborn child repairing its body in the womb can also allow those same doctors to tear that baby from the womb. 
In other words, it's not the technology itself that is good or evil. It's the human application of that technology. The phone in my pocket makes my life so much easier in so many ways. It was designed to make it easier for me to communicate with the world around me. It has the, the ability and even the propensity though to actually have the opposite effect. In other words, it can draw me away from communicating with those closest to me. And I've got to admit, particularly in 2020, I'm not good at this. I'm not good at this. I used to have solid systems in place to make sure this doesn't happen, to make sure I'm not drawn away from my family and the people I'm spending time with. And one thing I've noticed that the last year has done We've had to become more reliant on our screens in a lot of ways. So a lot of those safeguards have been let down. I've pretty much left all my systems behind. So now I've got to watch that my phone doesn't own me instead of me owning it. And maybe you're the same. If nothing else, I simply challenge you to watch your usage over the next few weeks and see how much you're actually watching your phone. I plan to, to set some of those uh, safeguards back in place, whether that's putting my phone in another room, turning it off for a time, or just making sure that all the notifications are switched off, blocking certain apps at certain times of day. Those are all things that we can do to make sure that we are focused on what is actually before us. See, we're prone to believe that new technologies only offer us good things. We find ourselves naturally drawn to the benefits and opportunities of new technology, but we rarely pause to consider the risk. And this is an even bigger danger as things happen more and more quickly because we're just wrapped up in the whirlwind and we've got to upgrade to this latest thing. We've got to have this newest thing. Advertisers lure us in with a long list of benefits and claims of better lives. But of course, they only tell us half the story. And we fall into this trap time after time because technology tends to wear its benefits on its sleeve, but the drawbacks are buried deep within. So the, the opportunities are obvious and apparent, but the risks are only revealed under close scrutiny and the slow march of time and experience. See, our phones again are a classic example. The first iPhone was released in 2007 and it's been a smash hit ever since. And now only 13 years later, we're just starting to understand the negative effects that these devices that are everywhere with us. And when I say in my pocket, honestly, they rarely go in our pocket, don't they? They're usually in our hand these days. How much negative consequences are coming from them? It's only in the last few years that we've started seeing well-being apps built into our phones in order to get us off them a bit more, but only, of course, if we actually choose to do that. So when adopting a new technology, this means we need godly wisdom so that we don't just run out and grab things uncritically. I've got some questions that might help you the next time you're considering a new purchase. Firstly, what human trait or sense or experience is enhanced by this new technology? This question encourages us to think about the ways a new technology will improve or enhance what already exists. To find the human function or sense that it magnifies or extends. We find that the mobile phone extends the human voice both individually and as a society. That the personal video gaming device extends the human hand and the imagination. We find that most of our digital technologies are crafted to enhance our ability to communicate. But secondly, what existing technology is made obsolete by this new one? We're just seeing this starting to happen now, aren't we? What's going to be replaced by a newer, improved technology? We might ask whether a given technology will disappear altogether or whether it will find a new niche or maybe as an artifact. The computer, for example, heralds the end of the television, uh, rendering it completely ob obsolete. You might say, hang on, but I've still got a television, but how much? Is your television actually a computer? What old abandoned technology does this bring back to mind? This is the third question. Here we ask whether there are old ways of doing things, old innovations that are called back into service by a new technology. We might find that new ideas and new ideologies call older ones back into relevance. 
And fourth, what is the unintended opposite effects that this technology might have? This is an important one. We need to look for contradictions, such as a device that promises great, greater levels of communication that might draw us further away from face-to-face -face interactions with those closest to us, as I already talked about. I want to finish, though, by asking, where's the gospel in all this? Because, you know, we can look at all this stuff and just feel guilty about what we're doing wrong. See, we're all going to mess this up. None of us are going to get it right. So it's good to know that God even uses our flawed use of technology to bring about his plans for glory. Just think about, for example, the timing of the coming of Jesus, which just happened to be at a moment in world history when travel and communication had never been so easy. For the 200 years, from 27 BC to 180 AD, the Roman Empire enjoyed a peace and prosperity that was unparalleled in the ancient world. At just this time, Koine Greek, a language which had risen as a dialect in the armies of Alexander the Great, was spoken across the empire, kind of like English is spoken across the world today. And that was to continue for another three centuries after the life of Jesus. It was in this context of the Roman peace and the unity of language that the Romans added a third factor, which massively increased the propagation of the gospel in the, in the first century. And that is the building of roads. Up until 150 years ago, the Romans were the greatest road builders the world had ever known. And at its height, the system they built spanned more than 400,000 kilometres. It's no wonder that in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son. See, God orchestrated the events so that the Apostle Paul and the other early Christian missionaries were able to disseminate the gospel quickly across a large geographic area. See, the message of the one who fulfilled the creation mandate perfectly, who always used his gifts to reflect God, to represent God in the world, and who did that on our behalf, so that for us who trust in him, God looks at our flawed attempts to represent him, and he sees Jesus' perfection instead of our mess. God saw that in the fullness of time, he brought about the right technologies to see his plan come to fruition. The most amazing tech, the most amazing tool to shape God's creation and his purpose is this though, that he changes us, that he gives us his own Holy Spirit so that as completely new creatures, we can say no to ungodliness and live self-controlled, upright and godly lives. So now as his people, we have a choice. We can use the same technology to love God and love our neighbour. Or we can use that same technology to sin against God and to ignore our neighbour and her needs. We can use technology to help us grow in our relationship with God and help others cr grow. Or we can use technology as a tool for self-gratification. May God enable us to glorify him and love our neighbour through our use of all technology. Amen. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you have taught us to pray and to give thanks for all people. Receive our prayers for the Universal Church, that it may know the power of your Spirit, and that all your children may agree in the truth of your Holy Word and live in unity and godly love. We pray for your servant, Mark, our bishop, and for all other ministers of your word and sacraments, that by their life and teaching, your glory may be revealed and all nations drawn to you. Guide and prosper, we pray, those who strive for the spread of your gospel and enlighten with your spirit all places of work, learning and healing. We pray for those who have authority and responsibility among the, among the nations and that ruling with wisdom and justice they may promote peace and well-being in the world. To this congregation and to all your people in their different callings, give your heavenly grace that we may hear your holy word with reverent and obedient hearts and serve you truly all the days of our life. 
In your compassion, Father, comfort and heal those who are in trouble, sorrow, need or sickness. We praise and thank you for all your saints and for the heroes of the faith in every generation. And we remember before you your servants who have died, praying that we may enter with them into the fullness of your unending joy. Grant this, Holy Father, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. And would you join with me as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So just a couple of announcements. Uh, those of you who are regular members of our services will be aware that we've started to meet again face to face. Uh, while this is great to meet together, we also realise that there'll be some people that are still not able to join us uh, in a physical sense. We've got a couple of options. Uh, one option is to zoom in uh, as the service is happening. A second option is that we're aiming to continue some of the YouTube services, but kind of on a, in a simpler format with a little bit less content. So you'll see these continue, and while there seems to be a need and an interest in people uh, utilizing these services or benefiting from these services, we'll keep them ticking over. Uh, if you have a strong calling to be involved with helping out with some of the online ongoing services, uh, please let the, uh, the staff or the parish know uh, in order that we can include you and, and utilize you for that. Uh, but again, just to simplify or just to affirm Right now we're going to continue these services, but they're just going to be a little bit simpler. Well, thanks everyone for being part of our service today. I'm going to conclude our service with these final words of blessing. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with everlasting joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Thank you.